if you stand back and you look at Facebook, what is that? What is it? What's Facebook? A company. It's a mind control machine. Oh, <laughs> oh God. <laughs> like we've just found our first, first clip. This is, I feel like we're going to clip that shit. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. GMGM. Welcome back to another episode of Overpriced JPEGs. I'm Carly Riley. And my very special guest today is Aaron McDonald, co founder, and I feel like this is a little bit of alpha, co founder of Futureverse. If you have heard Aaron on podcasts, on YouTube before, it probably was Altered State Machine. Would that have been what yeah, people would have that would be probably one. known yeah. you most for? One, I, yeah, I feel like you're like co-founder of, of multiple projects. Um, but now, you know, kind of officially stepping into the role as a co-founder of Futureverse, which is a sprawling, mind-blowing ecosystem <laughs> that I am still trying to wrap my head around. And I'm so grateful to have you here, Aaron, to help walk me and everyone through this. Yeah, no, thank you. And I'm really glad to be on here and um, to shed a little bit of light on what the future, future is for the Futureverse. Yeah. One of my favorite episodes of this podcast, I have to say, was interviewing Herman Narula of Improbable. Oh, yes. And I'm excited yeah. about this episode for a similar reason, because what you both share, my sense is, is like a really cool articulation of what the metaverse is or can look like or can be. That's um, And you're both in the process of like building it. So you can speak to it on both the sort of philosophical higher level and then also on like a deep technical level that, again, I... I'm trying to understand. Um, you know, it's so funny. I first heard of, I guess it was like altered state machine. I, you know, somebody was like, yeah, they're trying yeah. to build these brains that, you know, so that when you do play to earn, this was sort of back when Axie was at its peak or, or just coming off its peak. It was like, yeah, you'll, you'll just have these robots that will go like play these play to earn games for you. I was like, what? Like, what is the point of that? You know, <laughs> and uh, I've now come to appreciate how, how amazing this is. So just to give people a, a little teaser here, I mean, we're going to talk a lot about Altered State Machine, which is, um, you know, applying AI to NFTs in ways that I think just build out gaming worlds, metaverse worlds in, in fascinating ways. We'll, we'll get into some of the specifics there. We'll, of course, talk about fluff world, fluffs, party bears, thingies, many of the NFTs of, of um, I guess, that are now within the Futureverse world that are, are super interesting. Hume Collective is within this, this ecosystem. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I think we'll probably talk a little bit at least about like Silo and Seekers and the way you guys are yeah. gamifying running a node. I mm. guess that's another another teaser is that within this uh, Futureverse, you, you're looking to build or you are building your own layer one. So all yeah. of this good stuff to get into that I think people will find absolutely fascinating. But before we do, we do need to hear a word from our lovely, lovely sponsors. When it comes to NFTs, convenience often wins over security, despite scams being everywhere. Brands and artists have no other choice by complying with big marketplace terms and weak security because no good alternative exists. Which is what prompted Ledger to fix the problems of NFTs themselves and launch Ledger Market. The Ledger Market provides an end-to-end -end secure NFT experience for brands, artists, and users, enabling true ownership and control over NFT assets from minting to storing. Ledger Market secures NFT projects via Ledger Enterprise, keeping you protected from phishing attacks and scams. And the market directs users to Ledger Live, where they can transact with a contract directly, giving clear signing details instead of blind signing and praying. Don't trust, verify with clear signing from Ledger Market. Stay up to date on the latest drops and marketplace updates by following Ledger on Twitter and joining the Ledger Open Discord, which is linked in the show notes below. Bueno is the NFT toolkit you need to launch your digital collectible on the blockchain without coding. Every step of the NFT creation process, from generation to mint, all taken care of by the Bueno NFT toolkit. With Bueno, you can load up your art layers, reorder the layers, tinker with rarity, everything you need to make your NFT project a reality. Bueno even allows you to mint your tokens on the blockchain with zero code and offers advanced minting logic like linking allow lists, airdropping tokens, and on-chain royalty configuration. As a part of their launchpad, you'll get access to forums to run surveys, email collection, and build your pre-sale list to make sure you are hooked into your own community. Bueno is full of powerful tools you need to build the most expressive NFT project possible. So go to bueno.art and start building your own collections today. All right, Aaron, I want to start somewhere fun because I think as I've listened to you talk and a bunch of other interviews, it can get kind of like trying to wrap your head around it real fast. So let's do an exercise where like it's 2050 or pick your time frame in the future 
And I, Carly, am some like avid Futureverse participant, player, inhabitant, citizen, whatever. And I wake up like, what might my day or look like? Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's a fascinating experiment. I mean, I think 2050 is is a long way away. And sure. um, there's like not a, you know, there's not a non-zero chance that we get some fundamentally societal changing technologies that emerge between now and then. So you have to like preface those predictions with a little bit of that. But I think the essence of your experience then is that um, you're much more connected to the digital world. Um, and even by then, possibly kind of physically, you know, like like a cyborg. Um, if, if Elon Musk is that like, has a, like his a way, chip implanted in me? Yeah, is that what you're yeah. thinking? <laughs> like neural 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 net is yeah, Neuralink is trying to build that, and I think they'll have some success. Um, there'll be augmented humans by that stage, and so the line or the blur between the physical world and the virtual world is already kind of getting pretty gray. Um, and what influences one and what, you know, where the power shift is in each one of those worlds is like very much blurring. Um, and so I think that's a natural evolution that humans eventually will kind of keep going down that path. And, and, um, when augmentation becomes available, people will start to be augmented because it'll be, you know, it'll enhance their ability to participate in society. I think like between now and then the steps that we'll see is that, um, we in the past we've been used to dealing with the things in our life or interacting with the things in our lives and very siloed experiences. Um, you know, we would go and in, go into an e-commerce experience to buy some stuff. We'd go into a bank and then a fintech to do some finance. We'd go to a game to have, you know, that kind of play experience. We'd go to a social network to go and communicate with people. Um, and, as we kind of move down this path of the metaverse and towards this more digital society, those things will start to collapse into a single user experience. And so your interaction with the world and with the things that you do will become a much more integrated user experience um, mm. as opposed to the siloed thing that we have now. Do you think we'll spend more time digitally, which I hear that. I'm like, how can I possibly spend more time digitally? Or do you think it's more that the time we spend will, will look different than the time we're spending digitally now will look? I think the distinction will be that, um, we won't think of them as separate things. That'll just be the world. And so but what about like, like, uh, so like exercise, like there's something nice about like fresh air and you, going for yeah, no, a run but, outside. Okay. Great, great one. Do you wear headphones when you're running to listen to music? Yes. Do yeah. you wear a oh, heart rate monitor? No, but I guess or I'm a smart I watch know. or. No, but like, I do sometimes track on my iPhone, my steps. Yeah. Yeah. So already you're integrating a digital self and, um, and digital experiences into exercise, you know, and that's something that's become very popular around the world. Um, the ability to understand my performance by connecting myself to digital devices in those moments. And so that, you know, again, going down that path of like, well, augmented humans, well, then in that moment, maybe I'm getting real time feedback about my pace when I'm running or um, I'm getting alerts on, you know, the optimal stride length I should be taking. We, we have a portfolio company, um, Peer Sports, who does this AI coaching um, based on data input from IoT devices. And so being able to connect the physical things that happen in your body to the digital world is something that's already happening. It's not going away. It's going to get more. And so that a notion that there are two worlds or there are two things is already blurry. It's already super blurry. Like just imagine the world, the internet stopped today. Like society would grind to a halt. And, sure. um, and so um, we see this juxtaposition because we've come from a point of view where that that didn't exist before. You know, we didn't have that immersive, you know, pervasive, let's say digital experience and as part of our lifestyle. Um, you know, I remember growing up before the internet existed. Um, and so we can see the two sides of the coins, you know, the next generations of humans that come across, come along between now and 2050, 
they won't know that. That's just the world. It, so, is that the metaverse? Like, at what point is if I'm running outside? At what point of like digitally connected do I need to be for you to consider it the metaverse? <laughs> Um, I think it's already here in a sense, you know, um, my, my Apple steps tracker and my, uh, my headphones count me. Yeah. You're on the path and, um, and it's just going to get more immersive and less siloed. That's what, that's where I see like at a broad brushstrokes and you could get down to like, how do things operate in society and like, how does governance work and what do people care about? and what's valuable and how do we make decisions and all those kinds of things have like implications. But the meta is that we become more connected to the digital world. Um, The boundary between the digital and the physical world becomes less obvious. And, um, and the things that we do are um, the the silos between the um, activities that we do are broken down into a much more singular user experience. That's what 2050 looks like overall. We're already kind of there in a way. Um, You know, if you think about, you know, 20 years ago, I was in telecommunications and um, you used to go to telecommunications companies to communicate um, and you used to go to media companies to consume content. And um, and then, you know, what I'd consider one of the first big steps on the metaverse journey was we had social media which collapsed the user experience for communications and media and Mm. and and put those into the same um lane for consumers and so um we've seen this kind of collapsing of user experience start to happen already and that's kind of taking a next step because commerce is becoming social or has become social like i know that my you know, the main way my wife discovers what to buy is through social experience, you know, social media experiences. It's probably the same for lots of people around the world. And so commerce, which was over here, you go to the store to buy things is now a social, social experience that's merged with a media experience. You know, back in the day, and when I started telecommunications companies and media companies had separate networks, that's how far away they were. They didn't even share the same pipes. Um, between, you know, to do the, to run their businesses and between their um, offices or anything like that. They, they own complete separate networks. Um, and so that convergence has been happening slowly and is only going to get more and more accelerated. Yeah, that's wild. Let me ask you specifically, because a lot of what it feels like has, that has been built or is being built within this Futureverse network up to this point, it, it definitely feels like it's geared around entertainment, fun, mm-hmm. gaming, parties Mm -hmm. (laughs) so like just paint that picture forget if it's 2050 or it's tomorrow like is it uh is is sort of like the 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 next step in this you know i put on a headset or i don't put on a headset and i go to a party and i'm a fluff which i'm sure you guys have done fluff party you know and i'm and i'm a fluff but it had or i had bring my fluff with me and it has its own brain and it like knows who i am and it's like hey carly and it has an evolving personality and we go listen to some dj set and there's five thousand other people there all at that experience at the same time like is that kind of the next realization when this is sort of a little bit more fully realized and maybe it can be right now is that what it looks like yeah, I think it's a really good question because right now we all have this idea of the metaverse, right? And um, and that's been driven somewhat by Ready Player One. Probably in most people's mind, they associate those things. Um, and so um, everyone has the meme, but actually no one's delivered the experience, right? Even in even in Web three, like going from like sandbox to decentraland is impossible, right? That just yeah. you can't do that. And not that many people um, and, are going to either. You know what no, I mean? no like, one's going it's to It's also either. not like no one's showing up. So there's yeah, also that yeah, problem. Yeah. There's like, no one to go between get between them. them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So first uh, But problem. I think, so the, so the key, the bit I'm trying to get to that with is, is um, we've had games for ages. Like that's, that's been a thing that's been around for a long time. We've been, we've had like changeable skins or even marketplaces for trading ass, assets within games like that. None of that is new. The thing we have to always be aware of if you're building is you have to be able to give the consumer experience they never had before. It might be that like the nine other things about that experience are shitty, but you do this one thing that's super powerful that they've never been able to do before. 
you know, Bitcoin's a great example of that. It's like, you know, it's freaking clunky and, you know, like people complain it's slow um, and all these other kinds of things, you know, that are not ideal about it, you know, to learn about private keys and wallets and all this other kind of stuff. But I can send money on the internet, like without asking anyone to do that. That's, that's amazing. We've never been able to do that before. There's never been a way to send value on the internet without trusting someone else and going through their hoops. And, and so, yeah. yeah. And so it did this one powerful thing really, really well, despite everything else being shit. We haven't had that moment for the metaverse yet. Um, and so the mission of the future verse is to deliver that and to show people that, that it's not just a game and it's not just a space you can hang out with your friends and it's not just a concert but it's how you link those things together. And so yeah. our, in, our, in our view of the metaverse, we have this mantra internally, which is no matter where you are, you're always in the futureverse. It's not about an app. It's not about an, uh, an experience. It's not about VR. It's not about all of those things. It's about being able to take yourself, your digital self with you wherever you go and um, whatever application you're in. And so when we think about the metaverse, it mostly exists at the data layer. It's not something that we think about at that application and experience layer. That can be anything. Imagine, let your imagination run wild. You can have AI fluffs in VR next to you at a silent disco concert. Like that's all possible. The metaverse is your identity, your social graph, your communications, your assets, like all of the metadata about your experiences. That's the metaverse. And what the Futureverse is doing is building the technology to enable those things to, to be carried between applications, no matter what uh, type of application or experience anyone wants to build, whether that's showing up in real life to an event and having that as your way to check into that event, whether it's going to a virtual concert and that, um, that concert having um, your identity linked to it so people know who you are, whether it's carrying your avatar between applications to play a game or to engage in a um, commerce experience. All of those things are the metaverse. Um, and the Futureverse is about making that experience um, seamless and feel like magic to the, the users within our ecosystem. So it sounds like you're starting in entertainment and maybe we can talk about why. And you're kind of starting with yeah. this, the fun, flashy lore and rabbits and headgear where, you know, bopping to, to DJs or whatever. Um, but the, the the overall vision is expanding into everything. Your financial services, your citizen yeah. identity, your yeah. yeah, okay. Well, at so, least and, and like, we... a really great example of that is the the digital identity protocol that the Futureverse is built on top of is a citizen identity in New Zealand. It's one of the government's recognised digital identities, and so. That example is a, is a really good example. The same technology that powers your ability to log into the boroughs powers a national citizen, citizen identity in New Zealand. And so um, that, that's an example of those worlds coming together. That's distinction between those worlds not being separate. They're the same thing. Yeah, that's a great specific example. So let's just dive in there while we're on it for a second. So because... I'm not in New Zealand, obviously. And I feel like in the US, our, our systems are all super antiquated. And, you know, I don't, I don't think I have any sort of digital identity, you know, <laughs> like in, in the yeah. US, like I've got my driver's license and it's a very physical identity and I've got my passport and, you yeah. know, government services are all in different websites. Is New Zealand better or, or am I just thinking about what the citizen ID layer you're talking about is incorrectly? Um, I think it's probably better um, where, you know, I think, a smaller population. So there's, there is more cohesion and we're typically earlier adopters of technology in New Zealand. Um, so we're probably further ahead on the journey that than than many places. I mean, we worked quite closely with the government here to introduce the um, digital identity trust framework into legislation. And what is digital identity in, in New Zealand? <laughs> um, well, it, from a, like, like what, from a, what you're describing here, what is that? Yeah, from a policy perspective, it's a it's a set of standards and rules about how you can build identity systems that can um, that can be used within these service services environments. You know, as a proof of age or a, you know proof of who you are as a person, um, and so 
one of the one of the applications that um, we've built on this protocol is the ability for people to to get a national Kiwi access got a Kiwi access card um, with of course it is uh, with with its digital um, equivalent on this protocol. And that means now that, you know, the next steps you can do is, you know, you, you can sign into a service or you can verify at a service using this digital identity, which is a representation of you as a human in the real world. Yeah. So this is such a no brainer and, and, you know, it's a whole nother rabbit hole to go down, which is why we scheduled so much time to have this interview. Not that we're going to go entirely down this rabbit hole, but I know we're going to encounter 30,000 other rabbit holes <laughs> like these, but we're talking about, you know, essentially like verifiable We specialize in rabbit holes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get the pun. Um, so I, but, but so just to make this clear for people, cause I, I, you know, the, the idea behind like a verifiable credential digital, like, you know, citizenship yeah. portal, like it, it is this amazing one where it's some sort of, you know, NFT like soul, it would be like more soul bound, right? Like d- digital NF, obviously digital NFT. No. Oh, you're saying no, no, this credential, you can't have your identity pegged to something that's not soul bound. Um, I'm not. So I'm not a super big fan of the notion of soulbound tokens. Um, so your ID, your digital ID card. It it's it's using it- the W3C de- decentralized digital identity standard, which is not it's bro- blockchain agnostic, and it's actually really important. Okay. Um, that it can be mm-hmm. because it scales better and um, it interoperates with web two applications better and you can link it to on-chain assets that's that's the important thing um but soulbound tokens are kind of gnarly because um once they're assigned to your account then if anything happens to your account you're screwed and like you can do kind of shitty things with them too like i could send a soulbound dick pic to someone you know that would be like so they you're kind of there is this dis- <laughs> right. There's this distinction I feel like where verifiable credentials are the things that are are off and on chain and and not required to be on they chain. Be either. And then the, right. Yeah. And then the Vitalik sort of soulbound model is is only on chain, and we won't get into that. It, there's actually a good Bankless episode if you want to watch um, yeah. Evan from Disco and and Vitalik I, I know debate. Evan, she's, yeah, she's awesome. She's not pro soulbound tokens no exactly and she'll argue for like kind of the model you're describing vitalik will argue for the soulbound so if you want to go down that rabbit hole uh we'll we'll link to that episode (laughs) Uh, we won't do it here but i understand that's uh, i was kind of using it in this loose sense that is like you can't trade it away or sell it or like sell your you know identity it's not point being that it's a static exactly um and so but getting back to the original point here, which I think is fascinating, <laughs> is you're saying, okay, we've worked with the government to help kind of build out the set of standards and the protocol yeah. around this so you can issue these kinds of IDs. And this ID that will allow, that will unlock New Zealand's healthcare plan for you or healthcare services is the same one that will allow you to access the fluff world the party that you're going to tonight. Yeah. The borough, the, 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 yeah, exactly that, the housing unit that you as a fluff owner live in. Yeah. That's a really good example of what of what you're describing yeah. and the um, yeah. the scope of this. And like when you think about like a day in the life in 10 years, it's like, cool, I wake up and I take the same verifiable credential digital ID and yeah. I log in to check my pay stub and I log in to check my healthcare status and my yeah. whatever. And I use it to go to my cool digital party or my, you know, whatever. Yeah, and if, if you think about even in the context of like, um, you know, ga- gaming in the metaverse, the idea that um, you might need like age verified spaces or um, mm. or shards within an application or functionality, like when you're doing your, you know, banking or you're buying your goods in these virtual spaces, like how do you verify you're over 18 to buy alcohol or, you know, these kinds of things that we need in society, all of that stuff is driven by digital identity. So the foundation of the metaverse has to be built up from digital identity if we if we think this is the place think where things are going to happen in our lives. And what's exciting about digital identity and the verifiable credentials is you can have these systems where you don't actually have to share your age necessarily, right? You can just no, that's the, right. the protocol yeah. you can go and check and say, is this person over 18? And or there not. doesn't have to be anybody on the other yeah. side and it says yes or no. And the other person yeah. on the other side doesn't have to see yeah. your birthday and your height and your weight yeah. and your eye color and all these other maybe personal details that you might want to keep private for any, any sort of reason. 
um, which I think is really exciting. I mean, what you're yeah, and, and that, is this- that's kind of like a another, I guess, point about what we're trying to do is if you think about this 50 year cyborg version of us, um, you know, we want to make sure that as we progress down this path, where more of the things we value and more of ourselves um, is digital, that humans are in control of that, not companies, and that communities are governing it, you know, not corporations. And so that's why the mission of the open metaverse and the futureverse is really important because um, we're at this precipice now where this thing is happening. We're going down that path, you know, it's an it's inescapable kind of um, destination for us. We have a choice about how we go down there. Um, do we go down this, you know, what could be the default path now where those things are outside of our control and um, outside of our ownership or, you know, can we now take the second choice, which is um, have communities be in charge of these things and um, and um, and run them in ownership, you know, run them in infrastructure where the users can actually own those those um, important digital items or assets about themselves. The the question you asked about content earlier was, I think, a good one because um, a lot of Web three is um, grounded in techno jar- jargon that most of the world doesn't get. And um, and the really exciting thing that NFT showed was that we could engage a broader audience through content. And it was kind of obvious, right? Every major internet um, evolution has been driven by content. You know, all of the, the cool things we can do on the internet now, a lot of that was driven because of content consumption. And so, um, and content so creators what, are like the biggest assets. You know, you've got Kim Kardashian starting a yeah, yeah. private equity fund now, and Mr. Yeah. Beast is the biggest, yeah. you know, person in the world launching major brands. And yeah. Penn Gaming's buying Barstool. I mean, like yeah. everything is content now. And first, that's, you know what that ways. is? That's the metaverse. That's the convergence mm. of culture and technology and finance and commerce and gaming all coming together. You know, that's that's an example of it. Where you know those things used what you know stars are gonna celebrities are gonna run private equity funds those are different worlds they're like those things things can't come together well that's the metaverse they're coming together they're the same thing um and so we we, we are seeing that and evolve in real time in front of our faces now and our viewers um one of the things you can do to help break down the barriers and the friction for people joining the good side of the force you know the open metaverse um is to um, use content as a tool to to make it, you know, less confronting to start to engage with these protocols and learn about, own, you know, ownership and learn about artificial intelligence and learn about um, privacy and all of those other things that are really important to a better internet in the future, a better metaverse in the future. Um, and so every time we put out some content, it's it's designed, you know, there's a meme behind uh, in front of. Um, something pretty serious which is trying to teach people and we have this idea called play and and learn um, which is like use content to teach people about um, complex things and break down those barriers the seekers is is a perfect example of that it's gamifying you know decentralized communications infrastructure which is like this really like crazy technical thing. thing heady thing into distilling it into a game experience that people can come in and be like, oh, I can run a node, but they're not running a node, they're playing a game. Or the so digital let's, identity. Let's, like, let's go to Silo in, in just a minute, but I want to start by, I want to orient folks because we haven't, we've been yeah. talking the philosophical, which I love and we can keep doing, <laughs> but I, I want to just orient folks a little bit into Futureverse. And this is all like, break like breaking now you know we're recording this <laughs> weeks in advance we're not exactly sure when this is going to come out but we're going to make sure it's, it's out after this, this news is sort of broken which is futureverse y'all have been in the process of buying of yeah. essentially merging yeah like 10 or whatever companies 11. that are all sort of in the <laughs> 11 okay i think last time we talked it was eight so you know it's it's exponentially increasing Keep up. Keep up. <laughs> yeah exactly by the time this airs it'll be 14 you know um but that um that play in all these different spaces and and so let me kind of go through the what i know and then and then have you kind yeah. of react to that which is so there's this this sort of higher order future verse um the kind of parent structure you have altered state machine 
yeah. and, and kind of non-fungible intelligence or, you know, I guess altered state machine, which is this protocol layer that allows mm-hmm. you to imbue NFTs and, and various things with artificial intelligence. And we'll, we'll talk about that. Then you have these NFTs that will be imbued with this artificial intelligence. And that's where you have fluffs and fluff world and you have party bears and thingies and the burrows, which are the, the homes, you know, the kind yeah. of spaces that you can build out your own little mini, maybe a metaverse. You have games that you're building out within, you know, or a top altered state machine. You've got AFA, which is, I think, a soccer game. And then you've got the racing yeah. game and you have a boxing game, which you partnered with Muhammad Ali. Just again, trying yeah. to list this out to give people a sense of the scope here. Um, <clears throat> you have Hume Collective lives within within your o- overall structure. Um, Not within the structure, that, but in the ecosystem. Okay. Yeah, Within the ecosystem of Futureverse. Yeah. yeah. You've got this citizen ID layer yeah. that you're, you're describing here. And yeah. then you have you have Silo and and the Seekers and that sort of like yeah. comms network. Am I missing anything? Probably a bunch, right? Yeah, there's like a few other things, oh so like some gaming <laughs> gaming studios, um, payments. Okay. Um, we have this really great um, payments oh, protocol, immersive, yes. and Centropay. Um, so like the key technology elements are, um, you know, the network, the root network. You've got the um, silo communications protocol which is your social graph notifications you know voice video text chat all that kind of stuff um you've got the centra pass which is the um the digital identity um platform centra pay which is a way to connect um, digital assets to physical payment experiences immersive which is kind of like a DeFi um finance rails linked to mastercards um network and then, um, then you've got the content side, which is um, oh, in altered state machine kind of bought, goes across both. You've got you know the the protocol for linking NFTs to artificial intelligence, and then you've got the content they're producing, like the FIFA game and and AFA game and stuff like that. And then we've got non fungible labs, which has produced Fluff World and all the stuff around that. Um, we've got a gaming studio called Alt- Altered Phoenix. Um, we've got Shadows, um, which was a, a animation studio based out of LA, and um, and two others that I won't announce right now. Ah, okay, <laughs> okay. And you have a, a, it encompasses like three hundred plus people, and I, I think yeah. you said to me that you guys have more like wallets in use than like a like a yeah, lab. We, what does that mean? We're like the largest ownership? unique. Yeah, we're, I think we're the largest unique wallet holders um and out in the futureverse um ecosystem out of all the web3 you know avatar based projects out there um something like twenty five thousand um active user wallet unique active user which wallet. makes sense from the standpoint that you you know there's yuga has i mean i guess they bought you know punks and me bits yeah. now but it, yeah. it's still just like it feels like orders of magnitude sort of uh, a little tighter or, you know, e- easier to define <laughs> than, than Futureverse, which encompasses so much. So you made this distinction that I want to make sure people really heard, which is you're defining this operating system layer and, yeah. and the distinction between that and this intellectual property fun layer, which was what you were getting at yeah. earlier, this sort of like we Trojan horse people into this intense technical ecosystem by have by glossing it up with a lot of like fun you know and yeah. um and, and the education i agree with you i think silo is a great um a great way to kind of explain that my layperson's understanding of like silo is that the you know people um, who are listening probably understand that like blockchains decentralization runs with nodes and you have different node operators yeah. who are the decentralized actors that keep a you know or validators that keep a, a an ecosystem decentralized and running and my understanding is like you've kind of taken these nodes are almost like personified with characters and it's gamified. Yeah. So I, as an individual, am running a node, yeah. but it feels to me like I'm playing a game. Yeah. And these seekers are the kind of characters They're the main. to which these yeah. nodes are, are affixed. Yeah. And, um, you know, I want you to expand and on that. By but running say the like, node and doing the things that help the network, you kind of upgrade the capabilities of your character. And then you can take that character into the worlds and you know flex it or do things in there that you couldn't do before um there's a whole layer of um kind of tribal mechanics built into this because we want people to organize infrastructure in a certain way so you can kind of drive um that through getting attached to different tribes who kind of take on different roles and inside of the 
the network and just all the things that you would do, like technically try and take extract that and put that into a um, social and, and game mechanic so that people are playing something as opposed to doing something. Yeah. And what's so, you know, on a philosophical level, it's so important that people run nodes. And I'm, hip- I'm a hypocrite. I don't mm. run like an ETH node or anything. Right. But like, <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I don't even, I don't stake my 32 ETH either or whatever, but I, you know, it's so, it's so critical because, um, that's what keeps the, you know, that, that's what keeps the network decentralized, right. And, and prevents a 51% attack. It's what keeps it from just being yet another centralized entity, through which all of our operations are running. And so we need people and, you know, there's criticism. The Bitcoin community will criticize ETH for not being like decentralized enough. They're like, oh, it's all on AWS and it's not actually, you know, you're not actually protected, you know, in the way that a Mm -hmm. truly decentralized network should give you the protection. And so, um, so something like this in theory will incentivize, uh, you know, and, and it becomes a much more fun way to run a node. How far along are you on this? Like, is this a theoretical thing or is this, and this maybe gets us into the first, we launched the first um, node on testnet. We're on the root network testnet yesterday. Um, so we, I would say we're weeks away from getting that out to, to wow. the public. Yeah. So we're, we're doing this now. This is the way this is going to be structured. We're going to go kind of the operating system <laughs> side first, and then and then we'll end on the, the candy. So stick around for the candy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so no, but honestly, this is kind of candy too. So we, you've been mentioning the root network. The root network is the, the you know, your, your guys' layer one. Yeah. So you're you're not on you know Ethereum. You're not on Solana. You're not you're not even a layer two. You're building an entirely new layer one yeah. ecosystem, yeah. layer one chain. Wow. Yeah. So explain that. Why was that necessary? Uh, it's a really good question because it's not something you should just do. Um, yeah. <laughs> what we what we started with was not thinking about technology think about user experience. And so we mapped out like, what is the user experience that someone who's new to web three should have when they onboard into these systems? Um, so that, um, it didn't feel, it felt, so it felt like magic, you know, so they didn't have to kind of figure out all this stuff. You know, I use this analogy a little bit, which is imagine if you were signing up for Netflix and in order to, consume the content on netflix which you loved um name your favorite netflix show um you had to go to amazon and sign up for a cloud account and then you had to go to your bank and transfer some money across to your account to an amazon to to fund it some prepaid credit um and in that process you had to get kyc'd um, in order to make that transfer, like imagine if that was the experience yeah, of onboarding to, <laughs> to Netflix. That's I mean, what for my favorite make. Netflix show, I'd probably still do it, but probably, but but ninety five percent of the world isn't. You know, totally. um, crypto's been around for ten years, and we're at five percent of the world's population of crypto holders, and only five percent of those are interacting with DApps directly. That's how bad it is. Yeah, Even the five percent we've managed to like red pill and get across the line that there's something here with this funny internet money. The early adopters, they're risk takers, you know. Five percent of them are going on to do something else. That tells you something. That tells you the experience is broken. And so um you have to start with experience if you want to make a dent in that. And your point earlier about participation is really important. It's it's there's no use in having decentralization for 5% of the planet because that changes nothing. Mm. Decentralization, let's take the argument about network architectures away because everyone gets hung up on that and there's so much nuance on it that it's, you know, there's hours of conversations on each of those architectures about which it, what is and what isn't decentralization and what that actually means. The most important kind of decentralization is people opting in en masse to this different kind of internet using whatever system underlies that, that takes them away from where they are now. And so that's the real problem we have to solve is how do we get people in? So we went out and talked to everyone at all the majors about um, the user experience. The, the universal response we got back was we're, we're Ethereum, but cheaper and faster. 
And sometimes we're Ethereum, but cheaper and faster and more private. And those are cool things. Don't get me wrong. There's like a ton of really great research that's gone into making those advances. And we're all standing on the shoulders of the people who've come before us. But it doesn't solve the problem that is going to get that next generation of people into Web3. And so when we when we decided to make the root network, it was to deliver the user experience. And, and the way that we felt that we could do that the best was start from scratch and design a network architecture, a token architecture, all of those things that could deliver the user experience we wanted. Don't start with trying to make a faster horse. I think it's really interesting. I was just having a conversation earlier today with folks who are asking me about some other like alt ones. And I'm like, I think that mm-hmm. a lot of them are going to really struggle with their long-term value prop because for, yeah. for reasons you're, you're kind of outlining where I feel like obviously Ethereum's main problem is, is like kind of throughput and, and speed and, and that's a scalability problem. But I'm fairly optimistic on sort of the roadmap that they have for L2s and sharding and whatever. So like, I think they can kind of get there. So if your entire value prop is like, we're faster than Ethereum, but you're you know more centralized to achieve that and Ethereum you know, through L2s might become even faster than you. I don't think the long-term viability there. The exception, and, and I won't pretend to, you know, I'm starting to understand Cosmos. So, you know, they'll probably come at me and be like, you know, oh no, we are better. And these are why and we're focusing on the app layer and, you know, they, they et cetera. So I'm being a little bit broad strokey here, but Flow would be the one to me that seemed to have the similar thesis, thesis, right? Which is yeah. we're going to be user experience first and that's our value yeah. prop. Um I don't want to make you bash any anybody else by any means, no. but I'm curious of what you felt like you're like, what made you say flow also doesn't work for us and what we're trying to do and, and why I we think need to flow do something else. Thought about things the right way in terms of um, creating a bunch of services around the core of the network to obscure um, that pain from, from customers. I think we just went a step further and design that into protocols so that we could keep things a little bit more decentralized. Um, mm. You know, a lot of that flow experience comes from the fact that you go through the flow app and the app takes care of that stuff, um, which is cool. It's a, it's a good way to solve it, but it's the same way that centralized exchanges solve the problem for users. Um, underneath the hood, flow works much the same as any other, any other chain out there. And what we wanted to do is try and, Think of those critical um, user journey steps and make tools available to help um, developers stay decentralized, but also solve those user experience problems. So if you think of like um, our multi-token gas fee economy, the idea with that is that users can pay with whatever they have, you know, and if you join a new application, they can drop you a couple of coins in their game or whatever it is. And those can be gas. You don't have to go and acquire gas on the network to do that. It's still decentralized because it underlying mechanics still work exactly the same, but that user experience hurdle is gone. Um, another example is the uh, Futureverse Vault, which is a, um, a, a decentralized custodial key management system. So um, we can onboard users using a very simple web two type experience and then they can like start to take control of the custody and private keys as they learn more and become more confident in in um Mm. in understanding how the technology works um but they remain in control all the time and so um so building these little things that are tightly integrated to the core of the network um was how we felt we could deliver that experience better than others. You said something to me previously that I'm reminded of as you're you're kind of drawing this distinction between how you guys are going about it and how Flow's going about it. And I think it was it was something along the lines of like the metaverse can't be built inside an app. Yeah. And 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 I guess I'm curious if that's sort of what you're getting at here, which is, um, you, you know, like again, you're talking about a layer deeper, like it, the metaverse isn't yeah. within any one app that also then becomes just sort of a closed ecosystem. No, The, the metaverse is at this really, really fundamental ground seedling yeah. level where again, it can cross your, your government citizen portal yeah. and your uh, gaming portal and your bank portal. And there's not going to be a super app for, for as much as we talk about super yeah. apps, like there's not gonna be a super app that encompasses all of that. Or I should say that's that's not what we should want. We shouldn't, because then again, you're talking about a centralized, that. 
a centralized yeah. entity, an app, you know, yeah. like controlling all of that is yeah. very much not fundamentally rethinking no. the world the way we want to. I keep joking. Uh, somebody asked me on a, a Twitter space the other day, like what have been some of my aha moments or whatever ho- ho- hosting this podcast. And I'm like, you know, it's so funny because I have aha moments all the time, but they always come out like the same platitudes that we hear over and over again. Where I'm like, I just had the best aha moment. And it's basically just like self-sovereignty matters or like aha moment, like decentralization <laughs> matters. And I'm like, no, I know it doesn't sound different or like community first. And I'm like, I know this yeah. is all the stuff we've been saying, but you, yeah. I feel like in this space, you have this experience where you keep kind of re-realizing the importance of it over and over again. But yeah. the, the language you have to use to describe it kind of remains the same. And you're like, but it just matters. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But it ma- so it matters because of what we talked about earlier, which is the distinction between these virtual and physical you, the virtual and physical person is disappearing. And so what you're, what we're actually talking about is not control of my bunny avatar. It's control of myself. Yes. It's not control of my social media posts. It's control of me. And, and so that's why it's super important. That's why those things matter. That's why all this technology talk about sovereignty and decentralization matters because it's you, you're a digital thing. Now you, you haven't realized it until today, maybe, but you are, there's a digital you that exists on the internet. And that, that thing is alive. It's it's doing stuff right now. Algorithms are interacting with the data about you now and yes. informing real decisions that impact your physical life. We've seen this play out in like a very vivid way with the election cycles that the digital information on us has been collected and used in a way to influence politics and those politics influence the physical environment we live in. So the distinction between the digital self and the, you know, meat self uh, meet space self is gone. It doesn't exist anymore. And that's why it's so important. The digital totally you already exists. get what you're saying. And I'm also so sympathetic to the 95 plus, you know, or 99.5% of people or whatever it is that are like, what, you know, that like struggle because it is something that you just have to kind of live and breathe this space long enough mm. to, for it to really hit you. And, and that's what I'm saying. Like I was having that re-wave of aha as we were talking about this earlier around citizen ID and being like, that's why self-sovereignty matters, right? Like I should mm. own and have the control over all the data that makes up me, right? Like yeah. why? And you know, the, the simplest example of this is like, I am annoyed now every time I log into a website using my Gmail account. Cause I'm like, yeah. why the hell is yeah. Google my portal to this experience? Yeah. Why is Google my yeah. portal to this? Like I should control this and I should own this. And yeah. I would even two years ago, like I'm like totally normie enough that like, I would have been like, why do I really care? Okay. Google controls it, whatever it's convenient, you know? And then you get in this space for long enough and you're like, no, that's ridiculous. That's like freaking, it's annoying on this like cellular yeah. level. I find it annoying that they have that control when I should have it. Um, let's talk a little bit, maybe shifting gears, unless there's anything else you want to finish on this thread on this operating system side, though it'll weave its way into everything else, right? Um, altered state machine and AI brains <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> being put into <laughs> NFTs and being used in gaming and, and explaining the use cases there and what we can dive in. Yeah, I think this is another one of these like really important societal things, right? The the impact of artificial intelligence on our life already is enormous, and it's subtle. We, we're not like overtly seeing that, but like is an example that maybe the ninety five percent of people will understand. Um, and I'm going to kind of be slightly hyperbolic because I think that's a good way of kind of illustrating the point, um, but. If you stand back and you look at Facebook, what is that? What is it? What's Facebook? A company. It's a mind control machine. Oh, <laughs> oh God. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I'll explain why. How does Facebook make its money? Uh, um, advertisers. Influencing uh, why would, what I why would advertisers... spend my money on. Exactly. So the job of Facebook is to allow advertisers to convince you to change your mind about what you buy. And so it's hyper-focused on being super good at altering your thoughts because that's what it gets paid to do. It's a mind control machine. And so we've just found our first. 
first clip. This is but I'd be like, we're gonna clip that shit. <laughs> um, and so, and that is powered by artificial intelligence. Like in the background, they've got all this stuff learning about us and optimizing for controlling our minds. And um, and so AI is already having a really pervasive impact on our lives. And at first, that was kind of like low risk, let's say, because it was influencing me to buy this brand of toilet paper versus that brand of toilet paper, and who really cares? But when it's influencing who's in government, that yeah. matters. That really matters. That, that affects people's real lives, that some people may die because of those decisions, or they'll have a very uncomfortable life, or be discriminated against or whatever. And so artificial intelligence is already having a massive impact on society, whether people know it or not. And what we wanted to do with the altered state machine was a few things. The most important mission is to ensure that the average person understands more about artificial intelligence, how it works, mm. how, it, how it impacts their lives. How do you train or interact with an AI? Like what are the things that you can do with it? And how can you be involved in what AIs become and how they operate in society? And Ultimately, how can you take control? Because we don't want to say AI is bad. It's awesome. This is thing that can like propel humanity forward. But we want communities to be in control of that process. And there's two ways to do that. One is, you know, through education, because if people know more about this stuff, they're going to have a, a voice to vote. They're going to have, you know, policies to make all of those kinds of things. They're going to make choices about how this stuff evolves. Um, and... The other is a technology solution. How do you get it into people's hands and, and give them ownership of it? And so altered state machines about doing both of those things, create a protocol that allows people to own um, artificial intelligence or govern, govern artificial intelligence. Um, and two, use games, play and learn um, to in educate people and introduce people to artificial intelligence and start to build a relationship and knowledge of, around that. Um, and so that's what I, ASM is trying to do. And then you kind of look at, well, how do you kind of bring the people in? Um, and gaming is a really good way to do that. It's a really good low um, risk and um, ex, you know fun way to introduce people into a complex subject. Um, and it's actually really a, quite a powerful tool, I think, for the metaverse because we talked early, a little bit earlier about some of these worlds that are kind of out there in the metaverse land that are wastelands. Um, and one way to help um, make them more exciting is to have more autonomous agents in them. In fact, if we think about the metaverse in 2050, there'll be, you know, multiples of autonomous agents out there in the metaverse compared to real, real humans. Um, I was going to say, so, like, in 2050 is like my best friend now in AI. Could be, you know. Could be. <laughs> could be. And it, you may, you know, like, why not? <laughs> you know, if, if, if you find joy in that and if um, that meets your needs, then why not? And in a, and in a society that might look quite a bit different in 2050, um, you know, what's, and, and with artificial intelligence progressing potentially quite a bit in that time, what's the difference, you know, ultimately? Um, so, but we want to make sure that, that humanity has a say in those processes and, um, and that they get the opportunity to control and own those agent, agents. And that's what ASM is doing. But in the short term, we can have these cool games where we can take, you know, five FIFA all-stars, uh, four FIFA all-stars and put them against, you know, your, your, yours versus mine. And we can play a match and we learn a little bit about how to train an AI in, in that. Okay. Well, now I know. Um, you know, about things like um, incentive weightings. Um, okay, what does that mean? Okay, you know, that means I can, the way that the data that we put into these things and um, the, the things we use to incentivize the way they learn are important to the outcomes that they achieve. And so what does that mean for society? Well, well that, so understanding that will help us design systems to, re to reduce bias in the way that AIs behave. Because mm. if they're created by a group of tech nerds sitting in a basement that don't reflect the totality of society, then they'll behave in a way that doesn't reflect the totality of society. So if more people understand that, they can, you know, get the tools to start to make a change there. Um, you know, but going further and further down the track, yeah, you will, you will have a digital twin. 
that is powered by artificial intelligence that will do stuff on your behalf in the metaverse, your own personal Siri, if you will. Um, and we want to we want to be the protocol that allow, allows you to genuinely own that. So there's a lot to unpack there. I really want to explain this, like get, get nitty gritty about what owning this brain thing, yeah. right? You own this brain AI that you could choose to sell, for example, that you've trained up. And I think that's key to this whole like yeah. learning by doing and actually like understanding what AI is better because you've almost like homegrown a brain. So we'll get into that, but I this because it sounds like philosophically part of the motivation here is AI is already ruling our world. People need to understand it better. I want to ask you this high level question, which is like, in your opinion, how much risk are we at like being overrun by AI or like, you know, down the future high, AI? High risk. High. So, you know, what's so funny. There's a Mark Andreessen went on Joe Rogan and I like, honestly didn't think it was that good of an episode. And I, you know, I wanted them to talk about web three more, but they didn't really go there because, but it wasn't that good of an episode because Joe spent like two hours being like, am I going to be killed? Like, is AI going to overtake us? And Mark was sort of like, not anytime soon. And Joe was like, okay, but no, is AI going to overtake us? And Mark was like, well, like not anytime soon. And it felt like it was just like that. I don't know if you listened to this yeah, episode, yeah, but to me, yeah, it was just like that yeah. for like two hours. I was like, Joe, let it go. Like, okay. You know, yeah, like yeah. Mark is not that worried about it. You are, can we move on to yeah. a different topic? So I don't want to do that here, <laughs> but you I sound mean, like you're more in the Joe camp of like, yeah, I'm, I'm worried in the about Joe, it. I'm in the Elon camp, you know, like that's one reason why he, um, got started on Neuralink is because we need to upgrade humans to be able to compete. I think there's probably like, like I said, we humans as we are now won't exist in the future. We'll become some kind of hybrid, you know, between machines and humans and artificial intelligence will just be a, a skill we have, you know, skills we have inside of our, our own brain. But, um, do we just all but, become the same then though? Well, this is one of the really, cool things about um the way we designed the asm protocol um we the brain you get the nft that you get um if you're engaging with the community now has this thing called a genome matrix you can look at it, it's kind of this like spongy ball with lots of spikes and stuff on it um each one of those is unique and um so when you start to interact um with an application like a neural network, for example, trying to do a task like learn to play soccer. Um, that um, brain's unique spikes and, and genetic hits and code. stuff like that, its genetic code um, influences the way that agent sees the world. And so every single one of them is different. Um, and so they are genuinely non-fungible intelligence in the universe. And so um, we, we really think think that's important to the way that um, we can, you know, increase variety within these agents within the metaverse is to make them see the world differently through this, through this genome matrix. And I feel like the two, two things I want to call out there to what you're saying is a, it becomes really interesting because it's like you, they have personalities, which becomes yeah. constraints that as yeah. you as an individual are, as you're training up your AI player or and what, maybe let's get into the specific use cases, right? But like, as you're training up this player, one of the constraints is its personality yeah, that, that it right. has. And if you train it in one way and it's got one set of personalities that can do one thing and it not, and that's a really, that, that's what uh, I think partly makes it interesting to think of training these things up, right? Is it's not just like feeding yeah. it a bunch of data input. It's like, no, you have to be strategic as a, yes. as a grower of this brain and how you're doing it. The other thing is, um, what was I going to say? About, oh, uh, it also, it's kind of personality, like, you know, the different parts of its brain, um, it translates to different things depending Skills. on the task at hand. Yeah. yeah like yeah. It, it might make it faster in one world and it might make yeah. it. Um, yeah. You kind of, what we tried to do is create like these generic things that people would understand um, that map to the different regions of strengths and weaknesses. And so um, something that people might understand is speed, um, but speed can be translated to different things in different applications. It might be um, how quickly you learn something or it might be how quickly you move. Um, mm. And so um, developers get to choose um, how they implement those weights, those incentives and, and um, you know, disincentives 
um, within their application, but they can all coalesce around the same notion of what that region of the back brain means. So that when you take that brain from game A to game B, um, it does rough, it'll behave roughly the same against that um, task that it's trying to do within that environment. Shit is so crazy. So let's let's break this down. You, you've talked about this a little bit on other podcasts, but I think it's worth, worth going through here. There's the sort of three categories here that I've heard you describe. And, and I think these are all in a gaming context. And maybe we can talk yeah. outside of a gaming context after, but like, you know, basically the use cases for this being like machine versus machine, man versus machine, yeah. Yeah. or like companion AI. Can you break down yeah. what each of those means and looks like? Yeah, so um, the FIFA AI League is a great example of machine versus machine. So that's your team of AIs versus another person's team of AIs, and you can put them up against so each other. You're the coach of a match. soccer team. You're both yep. kind of the co- coach and the like parents. You know, <laughs> it's yes. like you're yes. all the things because you're kind of genetically yep. teaching it and you're yep. coaching it on the move. Um, so you're coaching up your own soccer team of yep. AIs that will battle against a soccer team of other AIs. And yep. that's why this that's personality true. constraint thing makes it more interesting because it's not just one size fits all for all these no. AI bots and which would be completely uninteresting. Yeah. So there's not like one super strategy that can win because you've got ever how many agents are out there are all trying their own view of the strategy to try and beat the next guy. Um, so you get this kind of rich meta game evolves over time. So that's one kind. Um, Let me ask one then, more question about that. That's yeah. this, there's a separation of like form and brain. So the form would yes. be these physical players and their bodies. And and, yeah. what, and then the brain is the, is the AI piece is yeah. when I buy a brain, right? Cause that's what we're talking about here, right? Yeah. Is buying like an AI agent. Is that, brain that brain is also an nft right it's, it's on the blockchain yeah. itself and that's this ownership of ai that you're describing which is now like it contains the genetic code the gen- and, okay and it's the key it's the key that locks and unlocks the different skills that that agent will get within the different applications that it in, um, goes into so you can use the same brain in a soccer game or as a um, virtual dj or whatever um, this is compo- those, it's composable. It, this whole ecosystem. Yeah, is like, they, you know. each one of those is saved as a skill file against that NFT that that NFT can unlock. Wild. Okay, continue. <laughs> that was machine. Ver- that was uh, machine yeah. versus machine. So, so companions would be the next thing. I think you can think about these as like um, could be as something as simple as an intelligent critter within a world. Like you interact with. Um, kind of like a mini game within within a metaverse. Imagine you go into one of these like empty metaverse worlds that hasn't had a lot of people join it yet, where you still find interesting things to do because you can go and like interact with that or could be a quest giver um, that's giving you some quest. It could be a oh, vendor. Quest giver. Yeah. Um, you could be playing a game as yourself and have a team of agents that learn your game style and play alongside you and help you beat a boss in a game. Um, that's the thing that made me say like, you know, your, your best friend may be an AI in the future, yeah. you know, because you know, there's a world, you know, I'm engaged and my fiance all the time is like, I don't know what you want from me. Like, I don't know what you want me to say, you know? And I'm like trying to train him. I'm trying to be like, Hey, here's what I need you to say in this situation. they just say it back to me, you know, but with an AI, I will have to deal with that BS, yeah. you know, over time, the AI just gets smart exactly. enough and knows what I wants to hear. And it just tells me what I need. Kind of like um, Facebook. <laughs> you know, exactly. Exactly. It's just feeding me back the information that I've demonstrated I want. What a healthy way to live. Just yes, men. Yes, AI all around me. Um, but no, I think that's, you know, this can be, they can learn it in a play style perspective, but, you know, there's a world yeah. in which it gets like emotionally intelligent. Yeah. Or it, can, yeah it, can, think, it can mimic emotional intelligence. Yeah. I mean, we, we could get philosophical about that or not, but um, eventually I think one of those use cases is your digital twin. You know, it's, it's, it's the other you that learns about you. Like if we think about like an early use case of that, advertising is actually quite a good one um, because on the one hand, I do want, to only be given information about things that I care about and that I'm likely to want. Like I don't want to receive all the information about shit I don't care about. Um, At the moment that problem's solved by like giving that data to someone else and then making those decisions on my behalf. But if we could have an agent that we could own ourselves and train ourselves, then instead of advertisers asking um, Facebook for my preferences, they could ask me. Well, the digital me, 
um, and I would have trained that, and 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 so um, it'll be responding to the the data inputs that I've given it. And I might actually be more inclined inclined to to directly train it, not like these kind of assumed facts about me that can be gleaned about the data on the internet. But I might give it direct information, direct feedback, because I feel like I trust it because it's mine. Can you give a specific example? Like what's direct information you might give it that might translate into an advertisement? Yeah, I mean, like there, there might be like things you would never tell Facebook about yourself. Right. Because you're, you're either scared or you just didn't have the opportunity to like a sharing moment to share that data with the internet. But you might, you might go in and be very specific. I like like blueberry ice cream with nuts on top but only a half a spoon of nuts like something you wouldn't <laughs> like necessarily give as data um but you might now because you you feel like that's that's you you're talking to yourself you know that's that's not something that's over here that's owned by a corporation and then i would have trained that 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 ai to know like what's what's fair game to share yeah. or what's what you shouldn't yeah you keep saying you say digital twin is it like a digital complement like you know like like i think of twin as being identical to you i guess are you it's like the mirror image. Yeah. But you're saying it's sort of like. The- I mean, you could call it an assistant or a twin. I'm using the term twin because um, the ultimate use case for this is that you do have this digital representation of yourself that can can act on your behalf. Maybe not in everything, but in a bunch of mm-hmm. areas of your life. Okay. All right. So that's the <clears throat> companions. So we've got machine versus machine. We've got companion AI. Yeah. And then the, the last one. Another uh, yeah, another fun one, I think, is um, man versus machine. And like with a little bit of a tweak here to what we've probably experienced before in other um, game environments where there is a you know autonomous agent, agent you might be racing against or something like that. But because these are like non-fungible intelligence, they're kind of an individual in their own right. Um, you can start to do some interesting things like apply permanent depth to an AI. Um, and so an environment where if you kill that NPC, they're actually dead because that NP- that NFT gets burned and they can't be replicated again. So, And would this go beyond, I mean, the thing, the, the thing that feels interesting to me about like permadeath <clears throat> in a world of NFTs is, you know, it actually has stakes now for yeah. people in yeah. a way it doesn't in a non-NFT world where, you know, if you, if you've spent years building up your brain and you're willing to put it in an environment where it battles against a man or another machine or whatever. And I know now we're off the man and machine example specifically, yeah. but we're on the permadeath thing. Like, and it yeah. dies and it actually dies. You've now lost this brain that you yeah. spent years building up and an NFT that presumably could be resold for value in some capacity. Yeah. And the stakes yeah. are just so much higher there. Yeah. So like really interesting incentive um, designs you can build around that. Did you yeah. uh, see the, the Palmer Lucky vr headset thing this is the oh, weirdest yes, no. news story yes yes yes, yes. i mean it's 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 all just it's very gimmicky because it's not a real thing that anybody's putting on it their head clever. i, I, pray to I God. mean it was clever uh, I, you, I explain to me why so pa- palmer lucky he's like he he made he's the creator of oculus you know yeah, and so he, he sold a, oculus yeah. for like two billion to to meta and he made yeah. a vr headset that if you die in the vr thing it actually just explodes your brain it has like little yes. shooters or it has like something <laughs> in the headset that kills you if you die yeah. in the in vr and I'm like, what a weird way to spend your time. IRL. <laughs> yeah, like actually you die. And he's like, you know, I'm not brave enough to put it on. I'm like, I hope you never are. Like why? Nobody was ever going to wear this thing, right? It's just sort of a... Humans are know. funny. You never know, you know? Oh, that's horrifying. I mean, I guess... That- I, hey, but look at it this way. You step into the boxing ring in a professional match. You're basically doing that. Yeah, I also I mean, think that's ch- weird. I mean, you're not quite... It you're is not weird, literally but gonna humans die. are weird. Yeah. People, no, but you're not... People you, do how many shit. people have died in the boxing ring? enough yeah well, i mean i also again i also would never do that so you know but i get your point i mean honestly enough it's that a you would think twice free climbing it. what's the like what's the free climbers you know like yeah. the people who, who scale these rock mountaintops yeah. with i'm like what are y'all doing i mean yeah. yeah it's that's not entirely dissimilar you're right Oof. okay um <laughs> anyway so permadeath with nfts i feel much more comfortable with um yeah i think that's a really a really interesting, you know, future that we're, we're probably, yeah. you know, c- coming upon. But um, the main thing is to like, make sure that in all of the stuff we do in the future verse, that we're, we're teaching people about this really important thing for society. And we're giving them the tools to be these cyborgs that can, exi- you know, enhance their existence through, through artificial intelligence, like a simple, another really simple, um, 
thing that we're doing is if you look at a lot of these metaverse worlds and applications where they're relying on this creator economy, right, to to build the stuff that exists in that world, again, a lot of them are empty because, A, there are no people there. B, um, not everyone wants to build. You know, some people just want to, like, hang out and chill out with their time. And C, even if you do want to build, you might not have the time or experience to learn how. Um, and so we've created the thingies um, within um, the future verse and the thingies are creators. And so now you have a sidekick that can help you make stuff. And at the moment it's making art. And then the next phase, it will start to make objects that you can use inside of these metaverse worlds. So now you can be a creator of things inside the worlds. And the next stage after that is it can create spaces. And so now you can have this personal meta metaverse that's created by your sidekick that you exist in. You can invite your friends into so give people the tools to like um, be creative in a way that they never were before. I used to have this like very vivid fantasy when I was like probably eight, nine and 10 that I had this like little fairy that would like come to school with me. And it was like this little, and, like sit on my shoulder and it was like this little friend. And yeah. I was like, we're just get we're just, we're getting very close. I mean, yeah. you know, not, not, not too, too A close, but we're like kind of close to that. <laughs> yeah. My little fairy thingy that just like knows me and loves me and like hangs out with me and is like cute and adorable. And it was like, you know, it was like my little yeah. Tinkerbell. Um, we'll spell this out for folks is my understanding is that thingies make generative, like make art that yeah. then are actually how they physically, it's like, you know, it's a, it's an AI generative tool that makes a piece yeah. of art that then becomes the way that the thingy is physically represented. So they're physically represented sort of based on the so, art that they created. Yeah. And then they're infused with the brain that created them. Is that it's a, a way really to describe it? Meta um, collection within our ecosystem. So we trained an AI to make art okay. and it made 10,000 pieces of art, um, like a canvas. And then we turned each one of those pieces of art into the pattern, the fur pattern for 10,000 3D spiders. Spider so each things. one of them's um, okay. fur pattern is comes from the art that was generated. And then that fur pattern, which is spiky, just like the genome matrix on the brains, becomes the brain that we use that, that that thingy is and now the thingies are making their own generative art for their users based on their own unique perspective of the world so we again used an AI i am to sympathetic make to the 95 <laughs> <laughs> percent but this is the thing this is the cool thing all of that's, that's cool on it i'm that, that's cool it's just yeah, confusing no, <laughs> it's all been abstracted away because all of our yeah. all our community sees is they go in to the underground app they feed their digital toy a moon rock and it produces art for them all of that other stuff they don't need to worry about they're just kind of having this fun engaging experience being a creator what is in what is the fundamental mm, i hate to say this again everything sounds reductive once you start verbalizing it right but like you know i i think you paint this really good picture of the metaverse because again i can immediately as, as crazy as it all is like i can immediately understand its utility in a way that i mm -hmm. kind of can't with like even the sandbox, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but something like this is very conceptually cool, but really like, why do I need a thingy making art for me? You know what I mean? Like, it's, or why yeah. do I need a thingy making a thing for me or a space for me? It's a really interesting question. I think more people want to be part of the creative economy. And if we look forward to that, you know, 2050 vision again, um, many of the things that humans do today will be automated. Robots will do those things. And so the predominant economy that will exist at that time will be the creative economy. Mm -hmm. And so, and whatever that is, like it probably won't look like it is today. Um, and in that economy, people will be assisted by AIs to do that thing. So really we're just kind of giving people tools to go on that journey to be creative, even if that's not a skill, if you don't know how to do Photoshop or like use Blender or whatever. Oh, that's a huge one. Yeah. You can do that now. A thingy will let you do that. Wow. Cause I mean, I feel like that's like the hottest tech in Silicon Valley right now. My understanding is, yeah. the, are these like, you know, AI kind of your dollies, right? But like, I can tell it what I want yeah. and it will generate a really good image for that. Definitely as a creator, as the, for the so kind that, of creator that I am. And animation is what we've, what we've oh, built yeah. in the future of this. Yeah. 
I mean, you know, I, I, for the kind of creator I am, it's really exciting to me because I, I, I'm, I can edit video fine, yeah. but I'm not skillful at it. And, yeah. and it, so it's time consuming for me to do anything remotely advanced. And so it's, it's really, um, you know, but I have a lot of creative video ideas yeah. and it would be so nice if I could just like shoot something and then verbalize and be like, you know, whatever, zoom in here, slow the music there. Like that kind yeah. of verbal dictation. I mean, is it, it would be amazing for me. Yeah. So it's just about that. It's just about enabling more people to participate in the creative economy. It's, that's as simple as that. If you were not in this like AI space, right? If you're, and I don't know if this question's gonna be too broad, but if you're just like a business today, like a consumer business, how would you be thinking about everything you're you're talking about, what you're building at Futureverse, and like, how should you be thinking yeah. about all of this? When we talked earlier about this convergence of user experience, that's the most important takeaway for businesses out there today. That this is coming, right? And so. If you're not thinking about how you transform your, your user or your customer experience to take advantage of this um, breaking down of boundaries, you're probably not going to be in business because consumers will gravitate to the best experience and the best experience will amalgamate all of those different things. And so people, businesses want to be on the metaverse journey because um, if they don't get on that journey, people will be conducting their commerce or their um, finance or all of those other things we do in our life through these richer immersive. And I'm not talking about like VR. I'm talking about like the collapsing of those boundaries right. um, is going to keep happening. And so if you're not inside of that track, you're going to be, you know, the minority that's left out on the outside. And at Let the me... moment, the way that's happening is through these giant organizations, right? That's, that's the thing. That's the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, how can we make it possible to be a viable standalone entrepreneur or small business in a world where convergence of user experience is, um, is the thing that's driving monopolies, right? Um, mm. Well, we do that by ex abstracting the things that make that monopoly experience possible and giving them back to the users and then allowing any application to interact with those things, identity, communications, my social graph, metadata about me, my assets, take them out of the system, give them to the human. And now the applications, anyone's application can have the same power as Google has with Google, sign me in with Google. That's, that's yeah. what we're really trying to do. So let me see if I can break this down, which is we have these antitrust laws, these kind of anti-monopoly laws that historically have been based on protection of the consumer from like price gouging. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen evolve in the tech age is that, you know, these borderline monopolies have actually benefited consumers because they're not charging, from, benefited consumers from a price perspective because they're not charging consumers. Instagram isn't charging me. Facebook isn't charging me anything. <clears throat> um, and so are like sort of, well, you're, you're, you're shaking your head. I mean, they're not, they're not, I'm not paying to use these, these products, I guess. Right. So it doesn't, they don't kind of fit neatly in these like historical ways yeah. we've thought about, you know, yeah. kind of monopolistic power, but they do have, but, but they have all of this control. Like what we're giving up as individuals in order to use these platforms for free. It's the, again, if you're, if you're not buying a product, you are the product or, or whatever idea, yeah. right. Is <clears throat> tremendous. And so you're saying, how do we break up these monopolies? What we can do is we can take away the thing that's giving them the power, which is essentially our data. Yeah. Put that data in this entity that you control and own, this sort of centralized identity that, that yeah. you have the power over. Um, and then any entrepreneur who comes along and wants to build something that's cool or interesting, because I, Carly, control the data, yeah. I can go to that and tell it, okay, yes, this app that I think is really cool can use these XYZ parts of my data. Yeah. Instead of them having to go to Facebook and be like, Facebook, let us use Carly's XYZ part yeah. of the data. And Facebook says, no, why would we? Because you're a competitor of ours. It's up yeah. to me now. It's putting that power back in me. That is so crazy and powerful. Yeah. What is going to keep that from happening? Is Are these big companies just going to fight it so tooth and nail that it like, are, do you think this is totally inevitable or do you think we could still be stymied? I no, I, I think we, like I said earlier, we're definitely at a precipice where it could go either way. What we have to do, do is 
um, show people how we can deliver a better customer experience and they can do stuff that they couldn't do before. Um, that's the that's the job, the mission of the Futureverse is to show how this works. We're bootstrapping that ourselves by building, you know, the technology enabling those experiences through a range of, we have eight different, you know, game and world applications in, in the pipeline that show a different slice of your life or experience that you might do in the metaverse. And then um, allow users to seamlessly jump through those things once you prove that that works and they and can, consumers can onboard through these really great brands that they already know and trust into this experience, then the game's over. At that point, that light bulb clicks. You know, the minute I, I do that thing I couldn't done before, couldn't do before, then people are like, holy shit, this is the only way I want to do things. Mm-hmm. But that's that's what we haven't done yet as an industry. How monopolistic or like winners take all uh, do will this end up, will this end up being right? Will the protocol layer end up being, and I guess this is a question of like, are you competing with improbable? Like that does, is the, you know, what is the, um, um... I don't think we're competing with improbable because improbable is solving some different challenges. Um, and I think we could be quite complimentary. Um, you know, the, the notion of, building this stuff in open protocols and open standards means that if people don't like the way we're doing things, they can just pick that up and go somewhere else. Like that's, that's the, um, the power of implementing stuff in decentralized systems is that you can only keep monopoly power by being the best service provider and providing the best economic incentives to your users. And if you don't, they have they have the cho- not just the choice but the ability to go somewhere else and it's a very different go somewhere else than what we've seen in web 2 because um, the number of times i've seen people say you know fuck facebook or fuck uber or whatever it is um, and then they're like they realize quite suddenly oh shit um, if i leave i leave all of me behind my friends my photos you know my connections all of that kind of stuff But if you could take that with you, if this application didn't respect you and you could take it to the next application without, with just the click of your fingers, that changes the paradigm. And so people have to be, people are building the application. They have to be much more in tune with their communities and respectful of their communities. And maybe there are some big winners in that, but those winners only live as long as the instant they stop being serving the interests of those communities. And that's the that's the power of Web3. Because I, because the infrastructure which powers it is owned by the community. That's that's the one trick that blockchain chains can do. And every game developer or Web two tech bro comes along and says, "Oh, but you can build that on you know SQL or whatever." Yes, of course you can. Except that one thing, you can't do that. And once consumers realize that how powerful that one thing is. Um, that community-owned and community-run infrastructure is the way they unlock their, their their digital self in the future. That's a game changer, and those companies that don't move in that direction are dead. CoinShift is a leading treasury management and infrastructure platform for DAOs and crypto businesses that need to manage their treasury operations. Every crypto org needs to manage its treasury, and CoinShift offers a simple, flexible, and efficient multi-chain treasury management platform built on top of the highly secure Gnosis Safe. With CoinShift, your organization can go from primitive, single-chain treasury management to expressive, flexible, and multi-chain treasury features, such as global user management, global contacts, proposal management, and many other features that can be shared across an entire organization, allowing users to save time and reduce operational burdens and gas costs. CoinShift even has data tools like account reporting across the seven chains on which it operates. Used by industry powerhouses such as Uniswap Grants, Balancer, Consensus, and Masari, CoinShift is speeding up the coordination and efficiency of the organizations that use it. You have to keep up with the frontier, and CoinShift makes that easy. So sign up at coinshift.xyz slash bankless. We're all bullish on NFTs, but gaining exposure to NFTs as a whole is difficult. How are you supposed to gain broad, generic exposure to an industry that's designed to be unique and non-fungible? Cryptex has the answer. Cryptex Finance produces synthetic tokens that lets you get exposure to areas of crypto that you otherwise couldn't. Their first product, TCAP, 
provides broad exposure to the total crypto market cap of all crypto assets. And their second product, JPEGs, gives you the ability to get exposure to the entire NFT market. It's the first real NFT index token, so you don't have to go hunting for rares or finding under the radar opportunities. You just need to own some JPEGs because JPEGs tracks all NFT collections with real time exposure. This is a first of a kind product from Cryptex, who has worked in close collaboration with Chainlink for months to ensure accurate price feeds for true exposure. Live minting and trading of JPEGs will open at the end of Q4, so make sure you stay up to date with Cryptex Finance by joining their Discord, Telegram, or following them on Twitter. I don't know if this is a non sequitur or a perfect sequitur from what you're saying. <laughs> Are you, is this a threat? Actually, I, I should say I, I'm pretty confident it is, but to, to what extent is this a threat to the concept of the nation state, in your opinion? Because, you know, obviously you're like, okay, New Zealand, we're building this citizen portal or, you know, this, we have this sort of citizen ID mm -hmm. layer in New Zealand. And I'm like, United States isn't going to go along with that. They're going to want to build their own thing. But at a certain point, they only have so much power, right? Because I, as Carly, could plug into some digital network that's providing me yeah. with better services than the United States government is. I do it all digitally. My identity card is now with, I just had, you know, the Afropolitan team on the podcast and they're trying to build it, right? Yeah. Like I now have Af Afropolitan digital citizenship and they're providing me with the healthcare I want and the yeah. six other things that I want and my digital parties that I want to go to. And like, okay, I've got to obey United States jurisdictional law or whatever. <laughs> but like beyond that, I'm like, I'm not really a US, you know, like, does so it, I think like, like our state if you crumble? draw like a long enough bow, right? Like what is, what is the purpose of government? Like primary purpose of governments or states is to define and protect property rights. Like right. that's. It's the, that's the monopoly thing on they, power and violence or whatever, right? The, like, they they, know, they have not... that because we give it to them. But the reason we give it to them is because we want to be able to own the things that ha we have around us. Right. That's that's really what it is. It's a property rights enforcement mechanism, because take that away. What do they do? Like sometimes they do a good job of providing shared services. Sometimes they don't like that's not a that's a supposed function of government, but it's not like a general outcome of government. And so the it's thing protecting the ourselves, thing universally, it's protect, protect yeah, ourselves. But I also rights. think of like at our fundamental. Yeah, like myself, is, like I feel yeah, more protected a, from somebody coming to kill me or do something terrible to me because there is a the threat that the yeah. state will step in. Yeah. yeah. I am yeah. my own property. Yes, exactly. Um, and so what happens when the things we value, our property, is increasingly digital? That's the, that's the <laughs> question. Yeah, my mind is blowing. Yeah, totally. So in the long arc, we, like, we you know, Balaji is going to be right again, I guess, is, the, is, is where we land here. Yeah. Balaji, Balaji, I never know how to pronounce it. Um, I'm curious to get your thoughts on on mobile. I, Amanda Cassett, who I love, recently tweeted yeah. something being like, you know, one of the biggest obstacles to adoption of Web3 are like Apple and Google and their super onerous fees. And um, I'd be really curious to get your take on that and how you guys are thinking about mobile um, on the future versus side. I think that statement isn't quite correct because we've seen enormous adoption of um, content in the app stores despite the fees um, by, you know, billions of consumers consume mobile, paid mobile content um, through the app stores. So that's not stopping adoption in Web3, I don't think. Um, you don't think it's taught like the, these, these kind of like, you know, buying an NFT where you have to pay a 30% fee or the seller has to pay 30% to, to Apple, you don't think that's a, a major obstacle? I think in the way that um, people view NFTs now potentially, but the way that NFTs will eventually exist, no. Even and, and, it, and outside of fees, are there ways you think that this, the, the kind of... Um, so, so, let me finish what I'm saying. I think... Sure. I think that particular point isn't isn't the right point. Until recently, the biggest issue was lack of clarity, I think, right. for developers because you could submit an app to the app store and your chance of it of it, you know, web three app, crypto wallet to the app store and your chance of it being accepted was luck of the draw and mostly no luck. Um, you know, we've been fortunate to have two of the only um, at the time, approved 
um, Web3 wallets that were able to store NFTs and interact with NFTs with the Silo wallet and um, the Burrows app. And so it was possible to do. It was just hard to do because there was a lack of clarity. Um, now Apple's come out and said, well, yeah, do, do your NFTs, but just play by the rules. Played by the same rules as every other developer out in the world and you're fine. That, that's good in my mind. That was bullish. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people took that negatively, but I was like, oh shit, now we have clarity. Um, and it's the same thing with regulation. Everyone's like, oh no, regulation, you know, don't want that. Actually, regulation grew every market that exists on the planet because it gave people clarity about what they could and couldn't do and it helped weed out bad actors. I think there'd be probably a fuck ton more people crying for regulation, you know, after the last <laughs> couple of days. Um, well, we're, we're recording this on the day that Binance has officially said they're not buying FTX. Maybe by the time this airs, that'll have turned around. But we're, we're recording this on like the amidst the Binance FTX just like, you know, fallout. Yeah. So weeks before this comes out. But so so at one side, I'm like bullish because now there's more clarity and um, and it has been an extremely successful distribution model for content, mobile app stores. And now Web3 can do that as long as they follow the rules. The FIFA um, game we're launching at the end of the World Cup is a mobile game um, mm. because now we have this clarity. We wouldn't, we probably wouldn't have taken the risk before because it would have been a you know a fifty fifty chance if you were, if you were lucky on whether we would get it approved or not. But now we know what we have to do. Um, the the argument about monopoly monopolization of fees is a much broader one than Web three, and I think that um, that's an important. Um, fight that the collective creative industry ourselves plus all of the other content creators out there need to keep fighting um, because it's it's extractive and unnecessary and um, I think until now um, Apple has built a brand that has been largely been seen as the good guys you know, they, if you put them up against Google and you ask, you know, 10 people who's the goody and who's the baddie, you know, a lot of people are going to, oh, oh Googie, Googie over here is pretty bad. Um, Apple's the good boy. Um, and their brand, a lot of the, the value in their brand is based on being the good guy. And they took the battle for privacy, you know, as like the big brand statements they've yeah. been playing with over the last years to, to, to paint that picture between themselves and Google. And now I think that people are getting um, more people are getting the um, notion of ownership of content and ownership of identity and ownership of assets in their heads. They're starting to see this app store thing as being extractive and un unnecessary and unfair. And so if your brand value is tied up in being the good guy and your product innovation, the last, I think, advertisement I seen for Apple was like, now our phones are green, you know, like, they're not really pushing the boundary like they used to. So brand is the biggest, you know, kind of driver for you. You have to stay on the, the right side of that. And more and more consumers are thinking that they're on the wrong side of it. So I think mm -hmm. consumer behavior will eventually drive a change in those, or we will see the emergence of a competitor that, you know, makes it makes a viable play. It's hard. Don't get me wrong. I don't, haven't seen anyone out there that can could do this yet. But there's a market opportunity for it, for sure, for someone, for a player to come along and take um, an open metaverse stance on hardware and try and win. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be the big tech battle of the next 10 years. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. I mean, there's a, a number of things I'd maybe be interested in responding to there. But I guess like the, the first thing I would say is, is, and I hear you, which is 30% fees are a problem in our current ecosystem where we have such a tiny percentage of people even buying and selling NFTs or being interested in this. And, you know, so they have all this kind of strong ethos, but, th but there is, uh, you know, I think about Instagram launching their NFT integration where now you can mint your NFTs on Instagram and sell them on Instagram. And I guess maybe I'm wrong about this, right. But it feels like historically they've been taking a 30% cut from companies who are selling in, in app purchases. Like you can buy mm -hmm. your tokens for your poker game. Yeah. And it was falling, the, the, it was penalizing a company that launches an app which feels different than penalizing and it's penalizing is not the right term because they're not intent there. Right. But like, but like the, the burden falling on an artist or a creator, right. Where mobile might be a much better way to interact with NFTs mm -hmm. and buy things and sell things. 
But the sellers are going to be like, why would I do it on here? And artists are going to be like, why am I going to sell it on here when Apple's going to take 30% of that? So in that way, it does feel like that's a that's an obstacle and a barrier to Web3 going more mainstream because seller, you know, because that's just- I a, think a if you think experience. about NFTs as being primarily about trading, it's a problem. Yeah. But if you think, you know, down the track that it's just the underlying substrate of all content we consume, it's not such a problem. Right, right. Um. It's still, like I said, it's still a generally an industry problem. It's just not specific right. to Web3. And on the point of Apple having to stay the good guys, I mean, it, it does, I think that's interesting. And I hope you're right that they have to maintain this good guy brand and that forces them to change. You know, obviously Epic's challenging them and they've got, they've got people coming for the throats now around yeah. this. It does feel like there's, there's been a shift. You know, you had your Apple as the good guy and the beacon of ingenuity, you know, and, and the sort of Steve Jobs mythology and, you know, plenty has been made of, you sort of have Tim Cook and sort of this era of like, we're just going to print money and we're not going to do yeah. anything crazy. Supply and we're chain not, optimization. Yeah. We're not like r and anything totally radical because we are printing money and in the print money, we're going to be, we're not quite so ingenuitive or whatever, but that's not what a word, but um, model of Apple, maybe they don't care about being the good guys. They're like we have the best, again, like cool. it'd take that, a lot for me that, to switch off cool. of and an you iPhone. you know what happens to every brand that shifts from being an innovative product company to the print money company they, they die are, they dialed over time okay all right good good i like that <laughs> um all right aaron this has been amazing do you is there um are there subsets are there projects within futureverse that you feel like we should absolutely touch on before we we wrap that we have not talked about um, there's a lot of stuff we could talk about. I think we've I know. had some good conversations and maybe we'll save that for a round two. I love it. That's how I'm feeling too. Um, a lot, a lot of food for thought here for folks. I so appreciate you hopping on and uh, we will definitely Thank do a round two because again, there's, there's so much to explore here that, uh, simply can't be fit into one, one conversation. No, it was a, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs> much for watching this episode of Overpriced JPEGs. If you liked this conversation, if you liked this episode, please go ahead and hit subscribe. It helps me out. It helps the show out. And it means you will get alerts and updates when we post new content. Thanks again.